This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yowat. It's Tuesday, November 3rd. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on. And we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. It's presidential election day in the United States as former Vice President Joe Biden tries to wrest the residency of the White House away from incumbent Donald Trump. We'll have more on that hotly contested race in a moment. But first, we we'll begin in Nigeria's north of the country where young girls are struggling to remain in school during the COVID-19 pandemic and aid groups say many are facing the risk of child marriage. If Yoki Tang starts us off in Kano, Nigeria. 15-year-old Umi Ali leads this team of girls in this phone repair workshop. Here, they earn money by replacing defective parts of phones, charging them, and transferring media files for customers for a fee. Ali says she dropped out of school four months ago after her marriage, but she's glad she can still work here. I am happy now that I am in the aspect of repairing phones. I could not repair phones. Now I can. And I can also operate laptops and do many other things. I am thankful. In this part of Nigeria, 68% of girls are married before their 18th birthday. With no education, these women aspire only to be wives and mothers, while their male peers progress in careers. In safe spaces like this one, however, created by the Issa Wali Empowerment Initiative, young girls learn to read, write, and develop vocational skills, including those often considered to be male-oriented. The man is supposed to provide, the man is supposed to be there, the, to do everything, whereas the woman is just to be the wife and, the, and have children. Then at one point, there was also religion was brought into it, that, because the majority here are Muslims. And they were using, it was a misperception or misconception about what religion says, because actually Islam says, seek for education no matter where it takes you. And it did not say male or female, it said seek, meaning that both male and female should seek for education. But somehow along the line, things got distorted and it became the man should seek and the woman, she shouldn't get an education. The Ford Foundation sponsored program Pathway to Choice conducted in several communities has empowered more than 200 girls and has seen 76 percent of the girls return to formal schooling. Among them is Rabi Salisu who says girls in her family never get beyond a primary education. Honestly at home they will not allow us to continue with school because all my siblings didn't finish school. Once you dream of going to school they will just marry you out. The Nigerian federal government passed the Child Rights Act of 2003, prohibiting the marriage and betrothal of children below the age of 18. Eleven states in northern Nigeria have yet to enforce it at the state level, though. Having laws in place like the Child Rights Act, um, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, domesticated, so having them domesticated in the states, and various other policies, um, and laws would go along, would also help in ensuring that girls get an education. The United Nations estimates there will be an additional 13 million child brides because of the economic strain brought on poor families by COVID-19. However, despite the effects of the pandemic, these girls are fighting to be self-sufficient. <laughs> I don't want to be a burden on my parents or my husband, so when I have a need, I'll just take my money to meet it. I am happy to return to school because it is great progress. The Women Affairs Ministry says it continues to equip women at the rural level through the development of cottage industries and training to better support their families. Ifek Etang for VOA News, Kano, Nigeria.
The Ivory Coast Electoral Commission announced Tuesday that President Alassane Ouattara is the provisional winner of the presidential election with over 94% of the vote. Ouattara wins a bitter election that sparked deadly violence and was boycotted by opposition voters. The results still have to be validated by the country's constitutional council, which will declare the final winner after hearing any challenges or complaints of irregularities. Opposition candidates who boycotted the vote, former President Henri Conan Bedi and ex-Prime Minister Pascal Afi Ingesan, released a joint statement saying they are not recognizing Ouattara's victory. eyes are on U.S. presidential election Tuesday as Republican President Donald Trump battles the Democratic candidate, former Vice President Joe Biden, in a tight heavyweight tussle for the White House as the African diaspora heads to the polls. A report by Pew Research Center shows a growing voting bloc as black voters in America of all backgrounds are among the most motivated in the 2020 election. VOA Salem Solomon has the story. For most African immigrants in the U.S., the right to vote is precious. And I vote a song, a Cameroonian American who immigrated to the U.S. in 1986, said voting is something he would never take for granted. Being fortunate to migrate and come and live in the United States, that civic duty cannot be taken for granted because we know what our families are going through back home. We have a, a war right now that we've lost many family members, friends, and um, the government's uh, response has not been adequate to call for peaceful, a peaceful sedimentary crisis. So here, if we are also complacent, then it's a lose-lose situation. Tessong is one of an estimated 2.4 million foreign-born African immigrants in the country, most of whom are eligible to vote according to the U.S. Census figures. He owns a technology business in Silver Spring, Maryland, and is the chairperson of the U.S. Cameroon Democracy Network. And although he is supporting Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden, he has helped register people of all political beliefs. What we're trying to do is let each and every community member understand that we cannot stay in the fringes and not get involved because those issues that are important to the mainstream Americans are also very important to us. As a community, go and vote early. If it rains, please take an umbrella sit in, stick it out. A new report by the Pew Research Center found that black voters of all backgrounds are among the most motivated in the 2020 election. Of those who were coming from, for among black immigrants in the United States, we did see a five-fold increase of the total population coming from uh, who are black and um, immigrants. So this is uh, really high um, in terms of, and this makes up about 10% of the black American population are immigrants. That was Neil Ruiz, an associate director of global migration demography research at the Pew Research Center. The center found that voters with African heritage are poised to continue playing a large role since they are younger than the electorate at large. Four in ten black eligible voters are millennials or Gen Zers, so they're younger. So in all nine battleground states, for instance, millennials, those who are currently ages 24 to 39 in 2020, make up a slight plurality of all black eligible voters. And although polls have found that majority of black voters back Biden in the presidential election, the African diaspora is not a monolithic voting group. There are no definitive surveys as to its political leanings. And the Somali American community in Minneapolis, some say they are voting Republican. Sofia Yassin Farah said she has grown disillusioned after years of voting for Democrats. When I saw the kids, they don't have programs. They don't have any uh, community you know, centers that can help the kids. Uh, we have a lot of problems with kids uh, with drugs. We have a lot of kids with, uh, you know, who went to prison. They were born during that 20 years that I lived here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, when I looked at, look at the policies, Democrats, it's just going to stay the same. Others in the African diaspora stress the need to think local first regardless of party lines. 
Olanike Adebayo lives in Miami and has roots in Nigeria through her father. A lawyer, she ran for circuit court judge and lost both times. Adebayo says a host of offices matter besides the national posts. November is very important for all of us, but I'm always stressing that local elections matter. They affect your everyday life, your local officials. We have constitutional issues and county referendums, and all those are important. But the people who do your everyday life, your councilwomen, your men, your school boards, your judges, those are your primaries, and that's when it's really um, important to vote. Salim Solomon, VOA News, Washington. Bringing more diversity to the U.S. ballots is a goal and a challenge for political parties as well as for aspiring candidates, as VOA's Carol Gunsberg reports. The changing demographics of the United States are creating more impetus for political parties to find candidates of color, including among newer Americans. Well, it's been a priority for both parties, including the Republican Party, for a long time. I was the press secretary at the Republican National Committee in 2008, and it was a priority then. It's still a priority right now, obviously. Well, we're a big, diverse country. If you're going to win elections, it helps to come from communities and represent the communities that, uh, that, that are casting the votes, and that includes recruiting more black candidates. But how do aspiring politicians get onto a ballot? Most of my candidates are African descent or African. Four years ago, Devisha Johnson opened a boutique consulting agency in Atlanta, Georgia, that supports the campaigns of African Americans or first or second generation Americans from Africa. I started out my company in Gwinnett County, which is where the largest, one of the largest populations of Africans uh, are. So I realized I needed to create a pipeline for them to be able to get trained, educated, and have political consulting work. So I personally went through a lot of different political training so that I can understand, you know, just what the general rule of thumb is to running political campaigns. And then I got a lot of firsthand experience. Training is vital to candidates, agrees Naquita Ricks, who seeks a seat in Colorado's House of Representatives. She got guidance from several organizations, including New American Leaders, which is nonpartisan, and Emerge, which prepares women to run as Democrats. They taught us how to raise money, how to present yourself, how to come up with your stump speech. And all of these things are important so that when you're out there, you're taken seriously and people are listening to you. Ricks was a girl when she and her family fled a violent military coup in Liberia. A small business owner, single mother and immigrant, she wants to amplify voices of her district, which includes the Denver suburb of Aurora. It's a very diverse community. One out of every five persons will say that they are from another country, whether they are from, you know, China or Burma or South America or Africa. We're from everywhere. Candidates who are relatively new to the U.S. face extra hurdles in campaigning. To be a successful candidate now, you have to be able to raise a lot of money. And I think first-generation immigrants might not have a network of donors that somebody who is more established might have. So I think that's, a, that's an immediate challenge. Similarly, they might just not be as well known. I mean, if they haven't lived in the U.S. as long. However, we do see a lot of first-generation immigrants running for office and winning office. So it definitely can be done, even if it is a bit of an uphill fight. Which is one of the huge strengths of Africans, is they have people power. The number one thing outside of money is that you have to have support. So root for us doesn't just come from United States. So people back home are saying, hey, I have a cousin in Maryland. I have some people in Texas. Now you have people do phone banks, you have people do text message banks, you have people to get out to the polls on election day. No matter what happens this election day, the experience of seeking office can help any future campaign. I think anyone who's considering running should run. Uh, you, the only way you get better at, at being a candidate is by running. Carol Gunsberg, VOA News, Washington. African U.S. citizens are out voting Tuesday in the upper Midwestern state of Minnesota. The U.S. Somali service spoke with four Somali Americans about the choices they are making. As an immigrant, as a black man, as a Somali guy, it's my best in interest to align my principles with where my heart is and how I can want to raise my children. Absolutely, I support Donald Trump. When I was a caucus, I was being elected for in a delegate for my state in the state conventions, and, and I was a state delegate, and I was for Trump, and, and I you vote. are voting for him again. I'm absolutely, I will vote for him again. 
this year I am supporting Joe Biden for presidency for many reasons. Um, one of them is for my being, uh, having the identity I have as a black Muslim Somali immigrant woman in America. That in itself is a lot of barriers to already carry and to have a president that consistently points that out and finds that to be a threat is a problematic for me as a young person in America and I would like that to change. Uh, I thought Republicans, I align with them more than uh, uh, Democrats. The good thing about Republicans right now, and especially with Donald Trump uh, policies, is that he introduced, there is a program called uh, uh, Platinum Plan. The Platinum Plan is about, uh, it's going to empower the uh, African Americans, and we're part of African Americans. It's going to create a lot of jobs for the minorities here. Maybe we will have, you know, specific programs for the youth okay. who are suffering. Okay. I'm falling for Joe Biden because country now struggles the wounds of the insults from the Donald Trump. I'm Muslim, I'm not a terrorist. I pray five times, I know how to live with other people. We live in peace, we smile, we work together, we love each other, that's the love. And Islam orders us to love each other, not to hate each other. For continuing coverage of the U.S. presidential election, visit voanews.com. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. In the stories we cover, join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, millions of Americans vote to decide who will lead them for the next four years. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. President Donald Trump and Joe Biden spent Monday trying to earn every vote in a few key states. VOA's Brand Pardon reports. On the final day of the presidential campaign, Democratic candidate Joe Biden made one last appeal to voters in Ohio and Pennsylvania. It's time to stand up. It's time to take back our democracy. We can do this. We're so much better than this. Biden is ahead in Pennsylvania by four percentage points, according to Real Clear Politics. But Trump in 2016 won this key swing state, despite trailing in the polls back then. The president held a large rally on Sunday in Florida, a state that analysts say is a must win for Trump to secure a victory in the electoral college that calculates vote tallies on a state by state basis. You know what gets crowds like this? Making America great again. That's what gets us. Recent polls show Trump tied with Biden in Florida. The president also visited Pennsylvania on Monday, along with North Carolina, Michigan, and Wisconsin, all states he won in 2016. But this year are either toss-ups or leaning towards Biden. Biden's main campaign focus has been Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic that is again on the rise in the U.S. Donald Trump waved the white flag of surrender to this virus. He did that. His own chief of staff said last week, we're giving up on the virus. We're not going to do anything about it. While Trump has emphasized his pre-COVID record of economic growth and argued that Biden would raise taxes and increase job losses. Biden will raise your taxes $4 trillion, massively increase your regulations, close down your factories, send your jobs overseas. That's what he's been doing all his life. With more than 95 million early votes and mail-in ballots already cast, 
This year's election is expected to have the highest turnout in modern times. Surveys indicate that early voting has favored Democrats. A Republican vote surge on Tuesday may make the difference for Trump. The winner may not be determined on election night because of delays in counting mail-in ballots and possible court challenges in close state races. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. Across the U.S., fears of post-election unrest are prompting offices and shops to take extra precautions. VOA's Ayeng Deng Bio has a look at how establishments in Washington, D.C. are preparing for action they hope never occurs. This deli, just steps from the White House, knows what it's like to be near the epicenter of violent protests in the nation's uh, capital. First thing that we're doing right now, uh, we, we're trying to close like at the big window because um, like uh, when the, in the past time when happened the first protest about Flo when Floyd passed away, so they broke the window, right? So the White House deli endured physical property damage when mm -hmm. protesters used these two rocks to shatter the windows. Ernesto says they kept them as a reminder of the protest that shook his work neighborhood following the death of George Floyd. An unarmed black man who died in May while in police custody in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Since then, protests and counter-protests have erupted across America, including in recent days leading up to the election. Incidents like these are raising concerns that tensions might boil over after the election, prompting business owners to take extra measures to protect their property. Many are boarding up, putting up plywood panels on their windows to protect them from damage. This business on K Street is putting up its boards. Others say they're already prepared. Uh, we just got boarded up everything because everybody was boarding it up from like a week or before. So we are just taking safety precautions because we did get hit last time and it was almost like two times we got hit and so at this point we just want to, don't want to take any chance. While employees are planning for the worst, some say more violence could complicate an already difficult year. I feel scared because the situation is like uh, it's very difficult because you know um, we stopped to work like uh, for almost six months with the pandemic so we are scared like of uh, being on the home again like uh, for almost two weeks again so you know it's difficult we need to support families we need to support ourselves for now Ernesto says his team is monitoring developments around the capital and hopes it remains calm with Jason Patinkin I'm Ayan Deng Bjor for VOA News Washington Muslim Americans make up 1% of the U.S. population, but as VOA's Faiza Bukhari reports, Muslim communities are mobilizing to cast their ballots for Tuesday's U.S. presidential election. 78% of eligible Muslim voters in the United States have registered to vote in Tuesday's presidential polls. According to the American Muslim Poll by the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, that's a significant increase compared to 60 percent in 2016. Within the American Muslim communities, there is lots of work being done on the ground um, in terms of get out the vote efforts, especially in key swing states such as Michigan and Florida. Mosques in the United States have been serving as community centers to raise voter awareness. The Adams Center in Virginia is one of the largest Islamic centers in the United States. They are mobilizing Muslim voters in the Washington metropolitan area and running the Adams Civic Engagement Group, or ACE. Until the last weekend, until the election, we are calling people to vote early. We are making them realize that they will be able to add their voice to American democracy. Ashraf emphasized that the Adams Center is a nonprofit organization. Their goal is to raise awareness among voters about the importance of voting, not to endorse any particular candidate. We have to make sure that whichever organization we work with, that must be in compliance with IRS Section 501c3, because we are an Islamic center, a non-profit organization, and cannot work with an organization who endorses one or the other candidate. In addition to Islamic centers, many nonpartisan organizations across the United States also inform Muslims about the importance of their vote and voice on the political scene. Their voice matters and their vote counts. In places like Florida, Pennsylvania and Michigan, the Muslim American community can swing the election one way or the other. 
So we want people as citizens of this country to fulfill their responsibility and to have that impact. Uh, how our kids' educations are funded in the future, our health care, criminal justice, even foreign policy, all of those things matter to our community. Organizations say they expect large numbers of the nation's more than 3 million Muslim Americans to cast their ballots by the end of Election Day. Faiza Bukhari, VOA News, Washington, D.C. Social media companies have made a lot of changes ahead of the U.S. election to stop the spread of misinformation. Is it enough? VOA's Michelle Quinn reports. As Americans await the outcome of Tuesday's national elections, Twitter, Facebook, Google, and other internet firms will be busy doing something else, monitoring their sites and deciding which posts to allow and when to stop the spread of misinformation. We've clearly entered an age where you can't believe what you read, see, or hear online. The online information ecosystem is a dumpster fire. Let's be honest with each other. At issue, will internet sites be conduits of misinformation about voting, election results, and post-election turmoil? And what actions might malicious content spark? That's the real fear, is that there'll be some sort of misinformation, uh, you know, cobbled together with um, calls for some type of action, or, or that people may take that as a call to action, whether or not it even includes an explicit one, um, you know, and I think that's the real fear right now, is that there'll be some sort of civic unrest. Twitter has started labeling some factually questionable tweets about election issues and pointed users to credible information. The company says it will flag tweets if candidates prematurely claim victory. Facebook said it could turn to so-called break glass options. That could mean taking steps the firm reportedly has used in other parts of the world, like Sri Lanka and Myanmar. Deactivating hashtags related to false information about election results, suppressing viral posts that spread messages of violence or fake news. The problem with online misinformation is that it can spread widely before internet sites, which are also sensitive to claims they are suppressing certain viewpoints, decide to act. I worry if they'll break the glass as quick as it might need to be done, um, depending on sort of what is happening in our uh, post-election period. While U.S. voters chart the future course of the nation, election 2020 is another test case of whether social media helps or hurts the democratic process. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, San Francisco. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.